All right, it's almost spring break, but not quite. Thank you for choosing to come in on this beautiful day and listen to lecture number 15 for Geography 130. Today, we're going to talk about post-World War II population control efforts, the history detailed in the chapter from Matthew Connolly's book that I asked you to read for today, which he calls The Birth of the Third World. It's worth noting that when he says birth of the third world, he's talking about the birth of the concept, the term third world, which is distinct from the birth of the third world in its empirical reality, as we know it now anyhow, which Davis dated to an earlier period, right? And then I want, in the second half of the lecture, to talk about carrying capacity, which is a key term not only in the works that Connolly describes, or the history that Connolly tells, but is actually a key term um, in a lot of different realms, and to this day is a key term in debates not only about population, but also about migration and a whole host of environmental issues. I'm afraid that the theme or thesis of the lecture today, if you were to try to identify one, would probably be this. First, as we saw, or began to see last time, that 20th century concern about population is historically inextricable from issues of race and race thinking, racial categories, and fears about race. And second, that insofar as environmentalism as we know it today was historically born out of, in part at least, these concerns about population, it follows that environmentalism is also historically inextricable from race and fears about race, races. In other words, environmentalism, as we know it today, um, has a certain historical legacy that it rarely acknowledges and has not come to terms with, I think. Um, and that is a rather unpleasant association or history, um, which I suggest uh, should be confronted, needs to be confronted. And um, perhaps we'll come back to these issues subsequently later in the semester. Are there any housekeeping matters anybody wants to raise right now? I posted the slides for this lecture this morning about, oh, I don't know, two hours ago. I apologize that they weren't there earlier. I also yesterday posted the instructions for the final paper, which I assume you've all received then. Um, feel free to ask questions about those instructions if you need to. Uh, the papers are due in lecture on April 22nd, okay? So you've got a little more than a month. All right, quick detour. This cropped up in the New York Times this morning. I thought I might mention it. Report finds shifts toward extended families. The extended family is making something of a comeback thanks to delayed marriage, immigration, and recession-induced job losses and foreclosures that have forced people to double up under one roof. An analysis of census figures has found. The Waltons are back, said Paul Taylor, executive vice president of the Pew Research Center, which conducted the analysis. Multi-generational families, which accounted for 25% of the population in 1940, but only 12% by 1980, inched up to 16% in 2008, according to the analysis. Uh, this struck me as interesting in, in connection with our concern for the very first week of class about household size. It would appear that under economic duress, um, household size may be increasing in the United States. Of course, we can't know for sure on average if that's the case. Um, this is only a, what, 4% 4, 4 increase in the last 28 years of multi-generational families. The rest of the United States population might, continue, might be continuing to experience shrinking household size, for all we know. Um, and it's still a small minority. It's only a sixth of the population as a whole that lives in multi-generational households. Nonetheless, I thought I would mention this um, and suggest that this is an instance, perhaps, of um, a reversal, uh, at least for certain people, of the, uh, the pattern witnessed worldwide in recent decades of affluence tending to reduce household size. Any thoughts? Uh, does the reference to the Waltons need to be explained? Oh, God. I'm so old. Um, the Waltons is a famous television program um, from when? Maybe the 60s, 50s or 60s? Um, depicting a kind of um, paradigmatic American sort of heartland, heartland family where everything is virtuous and lovely. And uh, I don't remember watching it myself. I do remember it was still on when I was a kid. Um, it was in reruns by that point. Um, and I didn't actually watch it. I think I even remember my siblings and I sort of making fun of it. But um, so that's, it's, that's what we're talking about. It's a multi-generational household. Yes? Ah. Oh. Awesome. It okay. Perfect. Oh, brilliant. Okay. See, this is why it's so important to have students of many different ages in our classes. Um, thank you. So it's a family in the Depression, dealing with the Depression. Um, it was still, I think, also represented as a kind of all-American family, correct? I see. No social security. They had to pull together. They had to support themselves, each other. Brilliant. Okay. I think it Paul Taylor of the Pew Research Center must also be old enough to remember these things, but he may not realize that his comment is falling on deaf ears uh, for much of the American population. Okay. Okay, let's, let's talk about the chapter from Connolly. Um, it's, it addresses the period basically immediately after World War II. And the context needs to be remembered. This is important. I mean, the chapter starts by noting that even though something like 60 million people died in World War II, that the population of the world actually continued to increase through the war. And that this was remarkable. And it reflected the extent to which um, other factors were operating to extend life expectancy, right? To reduce mortality. So that's the first point. The second point is that this, the World War II had a bunch of different, um, very significant racial dimensions, right? There was, in the first instance, the racial dimension of the Holocaust itself. So German anti-Semitism and um, systematic ethnic cleansing of the Jewish population of all of Europe that, it, that Germany managed to conquer at one point or another during the war. There was also the racial dimension between the U.S. and Japan, right? And there was widespread persecution of Japanese-descended people in the U.S., even in cases where they were um, American citizens. And there was a lot of racialized hysteria about the, the menace posed by Asian populations, um, not only the Japanese, but also potentially the Chinese as well. 
So you can't, you can't think about the politics of the period immediately after World War II without taking into consideration these factors. Um, and this doesn't even get into questions of race um, within the United States having to do with, for instance, the integration of blacks into the military, for example. So th this is a time in which race thinking and racial categories are, are even more prevalent, perhaps, than they are today in the politics of both the US and the world as a whole. Finally, well, thirdly, the war witnessed or you know, resulted in the end of the League of Nations and was followed immediately by the creation of the United Nations as an alternative way or effort attempt to forge some kind of international body that could help avoid the kind of conflict that World War II represented. And of course, at the end of World War I, the thinking was that by setting up the League of Nations that, they, that we, the world, would avoid any war like World War I again. Um, and it didn't work. The League of Nations clearly failed in that, in that effort or that goal. And the United Nations was consciously remodeled from the League of Nations in an effort to um, improve on those mistakes. And as the United Nations was, was sort of getting itself organized on the ground, simultaneous with this, the world's colonial empires, and especially the British, but also the French, were coming apart, disintegrating. They were disintegrating um, sometimes with the active participation of the colonial um, powers themselves. Um, the Portuguese, for instance, pretty much abandoned Angola. Um, in other cases, as a result of uprisings and um, rebellions that became struggles of independence and liberation. This only, you know, this sort of gets going around 1950 and accelerates through that decade and continues on into the 60s and 70s. Um, so suddenly the United Nations has got a lot more member states, these newly independent former colonies, um, representing parts of the world that previously had little to no stature or clout in international relations, uh, since they were subordinated to their colonial rulers. And finally, you have the emergence of the Cold War um, out of the sort of aftermath of World War II. It doesn't get started right away, but it quickly emerges. It's clear to everybody that the world is sort of divided into the United States and its allies on one side, and the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc on the other. And these are the dominant world powers. They are also represented on the, uh, what do they call it, the United Nations um, inner sanctum, so to speak. They have a lot of clout in United Nations decision making, even though the United Nations is supposed to represent a kind of um, equal body of the world's nations. And the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. over the subsequent decades um, get very, very intimately involved in the goings-on of all the rest of the countries in the world in a struggle to secure allies or prevent the expansion of the other side's allies. And this gets very much into questions of the well-being of the people living in these places, particularly these poor places that have previously been colonies, right? How to make sure that the people of these former colonies um, do not fall into the Soviet realm of influence um, or, you know, become communist, right? That's a key concern of the United States. So all of these debates are happening in this context. And in many ways, what Connolly is, is tracing for us is the sort of working out of or working through of concerns about population through this complicated geopolitical institutional framework, which is only really getting itself consolidated in the 1950s. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so there are at this point in time fears about population among people uh, in the, well, in the sort of global community of experts, so to speak, but particularly in the United States and parts of Europe. And you might initially divide these into fears about population quantity and fears about population quality. Um, neither of these are new at this point. They both have historical antecedents that are worth remembering. But the urgency is raised by the context of the Cold War and trying to avoid a repeat of World War II, trying to avoid the use of nuclear weapons. Um, there's grave concern about ensuring stability and peace in the world and the, and the sort of specter of war. So population quantity concerned the fear that population might explode. And it was likened explicitly to the atom bomb itself. It was seen as sort of um, another potential apocalyptic scenario up next to nuclear war. And this had to do um, partly with the fact that population had continued to grow through the war, which was a striking demographic fact, and partly to do with the range of public health measures that were now being implemented not only in the richer parts of the world, but also in the poorer parts of the world. And Connolly singles out um, DDT spraying as a method of um, controlling and in some cases eradicating malaria um, by killing off the mosquitoes that carried it, right? He points out that this was actually developed as a military tactic. Um, DDT was sprayed ahead of the arrival of allied troops um, in order to ensure that they wouldn't all die of malaria when they were fighting for various islands and territories um, in the tropics. So it was well known that life expectancy was increasing um, around the world, and that therefore there was the likelihood of rapid population increase, as had been witnessed in Europe, as public health measures improved there over the course of the 19th century and early 20th century. And there was also concern about population quality. And this might sound odd to us today, but it was actually, as I suggested last time, very widespread. Fears that inferior, in scare quotes here, peoples um, were reproducing faster, were growing in number faster than superior people. Now, we tend to think of this uh, in racial terms, and that was perhaps the major lens through which people concerned about population quality did in fact express these views. And um, earlier in Connolly we saw, he quoted from Benjamin Franklin, right, in the late 18th century, expressing fear about the preponderance or the, the growth of um, dark-skinned people in the United States relative to whites. This is a long-standing thing. But in fact, there were other axes of difference across which this kind of fear about population quality um, had significant and widespread traction, um, not just in the sort of big geopolitical sense, but um, actually at the level of states um, in the United States, many of which had passed eugenic sterilization laws mandating that certain people be sterilized to ensure that they would not be able to reproduce. And this was frequently targeted at people who were um, found to be insane or found to be epileptic or convicted of certain kinds of crimes. Um, these were laws on the books before World War II. And in fact, as Connolly points out, um, these laws remained on the books in much of the United States after World War II. The, uh, the disgrace of the Nazis did not disgrace eugenics um, immediately or in any kind of simple way. So we have to come to terms with the fact that a lot of people prominent people at the time um, routinely talked about this and, and thought about it, talked about it as a perfectly reasonable way of discussing social issues. Now, this is a different thing, perhaps, from debates about abortion and birth control. This is sterilization. Um, but it was a common way of thinking about managing these problems. Yes? You uh, anesthetize them and do it. That's what, um, in some cases, these programs were not involuntary, but in many cases, they were involuntary. 
So they didn't have any say-so. And, and we'll see later on in Conley that um, both compulsory and voluntary sterilization programs um, become a major part of post-World War II population control efforts um, in other parts of the world. So and I believe it's in one year in India alone, 8 million men were sterilized. So this is going to, come, this is going to reappear um, under the guise of controlling population growth, but its origins lie in arguments about improving the population by essentially preventing the reproduction of people deemed to be somehow inherently or biologically inferior. Yeah. Uh, in, this country, was that part of the Red Scare? in this country, was this part of the Red Scare? I'm not sure. I, I have not heard of st sterilization laws aimed at sterilizing um, communists, right? Um, who knows, though? Trials, trials of communists? Well, I mean, the Red Scare and, and the various persecutions of communists can certainly be seen as another variant of the kind of hysteria that we're talking about here, perhaps. But um, they're not the same thing. And I'm not even sure that they're overlapping things. Yeah. Um, more success in what sense? In, in, in actually sterilizing people? Um, I don't know, and I'm not sure how you would measure it, because you'd be dealing with very, very different orders of magnitude of numbers, I suspect, right? The number of people institutionalized for insanity was probably small compared to the number of people in prison. So I'm not sure. And it's not like all prisoners were sterilized either. I mean, it was certain classes or categories of prisoners, as far as I understand. But that would be interesting if perhaps a little, um, uh, what do I want to say, uh, macabre to look into. Okay. So I put these up here just to give you a sense of some of the, um, some of the ways that this type of thinking these fears about population uh, manifested themselves in um, popular culture. Um, this one up here is the cover of Time magazine um, from January 1960. And it, the cover story is about the population bomb. And it's interesting just to sort of look at the depictions of people provided here. Um, clearly, I mean, it's not that there are no white people, um, but the preponderance of these images are not only of non-white people, but also of, in many cases, non-white people depicted in a kind of primitive way or rendered sort of primitive um, by their dress, for example. Um, this book here, um, which came out in 1968, quite famous, The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich, who is a professor at Stanford, um, Population Control or Race to Oblivion. Um, the argument was, was widely made that basically we had no choice but to control population because if we didn't control population, the game was up and humanity would be uh, terminated. Right? We would, basically, this was uh, mandatory. Um, while you are reading these words, four, million, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. Um, it's there to give a sense of the urgency of this. Um, you know, it actually comes up in later on in Conley's book that Ehrlich wrote this book on commission. He was hired by the Sierra Club to write this book and apparently wrote it in about three months. Um, it's actually, as becomes clear from Conley's book, um, it's not when this fear starts. It, in fact, is an expression of this fear rather than an important part in raising this fear. Um, this one, I thought was sort of funny, the population bomb, while it appears to have landed, but it didn't explode, um, perhaps suggests the kind of a central paradox of all of this thinking. Um, and this goes right back to Malthus. There is this weird sense in which people, can, people making these arguments say that the world is already overpopulated. And we'll see a passage from Ehrlich later on in this lecture. Um, the statement is, it's, it's asserted in quite blunt terms, that there are way too many people on Earth already. And yet, at the same time, um, if that were the case, then why have these apocalyptic outcomes not already occurred? Um, the bomb is sort of here, but it hasn't exploded. It's not clear how to make sense of it. And then finally, the woman with the poster, save the planet, kill yourself. Um, I honestly don't know whether, I, I assume she was being sarcastic, um, but it's hard to say for sure. So the central point of this chapter from Conley, in my opinion, is that development, as we currently understand the term, was formulated as a policy prescription and conceptualized and given its name in this period of time in response to the sort of array of forces and, and issues um, that were dominating these discussions about population. That development was a sort of solution, at least in some kind of theoretical sense, um, that managed to come out of the end of all of these pitched battles and conflicts about exactly how to deal with the population problem. So demographic transition theory, <coughs> which we have seen from Libby Bacci, was actually sort of form formulated at this time. It was put forward by demographers as a central theory of their discipline and given a kind of scientific um, credibility or, or solidity authority. And it, quote, made reducing fertility integral to the modernization process. So, and we've seen this already, the, 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 the demographic multiplier or the transition multiplier concerns how much bigger is your population at the beginning and the end, at the end compared to the beginning of the transition, the demographic transition. And there's, even if you grant that the transition is in fact a coherent theory, there's plenty of room for that multiplier to be larger or smaller, right? You can get the decline in mortality and then at some subsequent date get the decline in fertility, but how long that takes, how long that lag is will determine how many people you actually end up with in your population when the transition finishes and you stabilize growth, right? So the equation was that you will only get the decline in fertility when you get the kinds of conditions that witnessed its decline in Europe. A growth in wealth, a growth in sort of modern, urban, industrial, civilized society, uh, expansion of education, an extension of, of um, life expectancy that will then translate into changes in the behavior of people regarding reproduction. This is offered as a solution, or appears to be a solution, insofar as differential fertility at, between the North and South came to be seen as part of a crisis in the colonial world. There was fear that the poor parts of the world were poor. That poverty made them potentially susceptible to the ideologies of communism and to the possibility of general instability and insurrection. There was a sense that in a poor country, if you have more people, everyone's just going to be poorer because there's so little to go, around with, to go around to begin with. And it was known that these populations were increasing rapidly. So new international institutions could transform the old civilizing mission into a modernizing mission. If the